here we are in the Becker Sand and Mushroom Company cave, um, which it started about the year 1900. Uh, but this cave, which is the largest mushroom growing cave uh, in St. Paul, uh, with about two and a half kilometers of passages, it was at its height in the Roaring Twenties. Um, and there is a beautiful 1923 newspaper article by Jay Ludden that talks about this cave. And, uh, you know, and he describes it as a medieval temple. Now, where I'm standing, it looks like a junk pile. But as we'll, we'll go off in the back and we're going to see some passages that are indeed somewhat, you know, like the passages in a cathedral. They're very high, nice, they're very, you know, pointed passages. Um, in 1929 City Directory, you know, they did, they, you know, the, the Becker Cave is mentioned. Um, and then it kind of, uh, it wasn't again until about World War II that we see a mention of it, uh, when an Italian mushroom grower uh, by the name of Nazareno Capacaso um, with, grew mushrooms here. And after World War II, we don't hear about it again in the city directories as, as actually as a mushroom growing cave. And I think it might have been abandoned for many years. Um, but in the, uh, in, in the in the 60s, again, it comes into the record. Um, uh, a guy by the name of Lyman Brown bought the cave. And I know there's uh, the urban explorers call this the Lyman Brown cave. But Lyman Brown was just a real estate guy. He wasn't, you know, one of the, he wasn't a mushroom grower, wasn't one of the historic mushroom growers at all. Um, and it was about that time that this cave was surveyed um, for, at, uh, for use as a fallout shelter um, in the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. They wanted to know how many people they could fit in here in the event of a nuclear apocalypse. And... The calculation was about 1,774 people could fit in here. Actually, as you'll see, probably, I guess, you know, probably a lot more you could actually pack. And, you know, if you're going to go with the uh, Tokyo subway density, you could pack a lot more people in here uh, than that. Uh, in 1965, the cave was flooded. Um, the Mississippi River, as we call it, the Noah's Flood. And so there's probably a really good flood layer in here. But we hardly, we don't know about that so much because, as I said, I'm standing, you can see this junk. In 1985, unfortunately, uh, the old high bridge, when they knocked that down to build the present high bridge, they pushed all that junk in here. And so that's what you're looking at. You're looking at concrete looking at rebar, steel beams, and so on, that are associated with the old high bridge. Um, and it is created in this cave, as you will see, what we call inverted topography. And that is to say, as the bulldozer pushed it in, we can tell it was some kind of bulldozer, something with a blade, because there are successive waves of debris, like, you know, there was, they, they came up and then successively. And you see that all the way back through the cave. Um, and so they, uh, they pushed this material in here. And what it did is it, in the high parts of the cave, that's where they had the best access along this main axis that we're on, the, the main axis of the cave here. Um, and it created the, the biggest hills there. And in the small path, what had been small passages, they couldn't really get in there with the bulldozer or earth moving equipment. So they kind of left those alone. So the great became small and the small became great. And that's what we call inverted topography. Um, there was one map made of this cave. In addition to the Cold War era map, um, Gerboth made a map of this cave uh, in 1981. It was the last pre-fill map before they put all this junk in here. And again, he shows this cave, like all the maps show this cave, it's one long, we're standing at the original entrance on Water Street here, which is just behind the camera. And this axis is, it, again, it doesn't look like very big, but that's because of the inverted topography phenomenon. And this one goes all the way back, and then you have branches coming off, which he successively numbered, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's sort of like a, 
uh, a telephone pole. You know, if you were to look at a telephone pole with the, the main pole and then these things coming off like that. Um, I should just say one more thing about the name of the cave, the Becker Sand and Mushroom Company Cave. Um, this was, it had a dual purpose. This is, wasn't just mushroom growing here. Um, they also uh, used it. It was also initially carved out for the silica, perhaps for glass making, for foundry, or for making of mortar. Okay, and as the sand, as the sand miners kind of pushed, pushed their way forward, the mushroom growers could come in uh, behind them. And and so we're going to see some interesting stuff as we kind of make our way through this cave. So this is just one side passage. Kind of give you a scale of this cave. And that's actually after it's been backfilled, so pretty impressive. So there's indents. Actually kind of looks like a mailbox set up or something. Cave mail, I don't know. Yeah, well what it is, it's, it's uh, concrete, there's regular concrete solid block at the bottom and the top, and then the- Oh, they just kind of made it to match? Concrete block in, the, in between. Ah. Uh, so, and then there's kind of a wood frame up at the top part. Interesting. Filled with rock. Might be back to the surface? A bent? Pardon me? Ventilation shaft that's been backfilled? Probably, yeah. I don't, I don't know anything about ventilation shaft. Okay. Was, you know. All right, well, okay. Um, so we're going to take like a little roundabout in the cave and kind of go up and down the side passages. So we're more or less at the Water Street entrance of the cave. And here's the main access. Um, and so we're right now, we're on this, this first um, side passage here. And uh, again, this, this, I'm just using the Gerbothian numeration he came up with in 1981. We'll come around up here and then up to number two and up to number three uh, and so on as we make our way. It's ultimately deep in the cave. He marked something here called the Devil's Altar or the Shrine or something like that. So I guess that's going to be our, our fire point. We're kind of heading uh, up in, in that uh, direction, but it it does it does this is kind of you know all these notes are overlaid on this old Cold War map from 1962 when they thought they were going to stuff uh, a bunch of people in here. So we can compare it and see if anything has collapsed or you know, if there's somebody you know somebody's dug a new passage or something like that as as we make our way through. So we're just going to head up now up the first side passage. Could be actually from uh, this groundwater coming out at the uh, the core of contact. So this rope goes up to the surface, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, if we won't die of thirst. If we get trapped in here. We got a. Uh... Wow, I go way up there. Yeah. Yeah, we got a nice. Uh... Ventilation shaft or <laughs> working our way down. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is the cross cut between the first and the second parallel. And this is the first place I've seen that, that we've done today gives you a sense of the full height of the Becker, the Becker Sand and Mushroom Company cave. And again, J. Ludden in 1923 compared this to a medieval cathedral, this cave. And you really get, you start to get a sense of that now, you know, that high pointed. Uh, it does become a question whether this cave, this is all St. Peter sandstone, obviously. Uh, it does become a question, I think this comes right up against the Platteville limestone, the next layer above. I don't know if there are any rooms in this cave that actually break out into the Platteville limestone above us. We'll find out. Maybe there's some dome that uh, where, where it's migrated up into that layer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's interesting, that door to nowhere. Oh, yeah. Um, isn't there like some song or something like the door? Wait, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, we're walking along in the, the second side passage, and we came across this helpful map of the cave system that somebody drew um, and you can see here now uh, this is this is the this here is the Becker cave and they're calling it the Lyman cave again I said that's that's a later name uh, we're about right here uh, as far as on this map so we got you know we got a long ways to go here uh, and then they helpfully illustrate here they call MT the milk truck caves right over here so that's kind of unusual uh, i just wanted to say a little bit of uh, a little bit about the smoke blackening that you see this this is so intense you know where they've carved they scraped away the smoke the soot and did to reveal the white sandstone underneath um, and the fact that this soot is ubiquitous throughout the two and a half kilometers of this cave Suggests to me this was not this is not like a localized fire campfire in one room. This was a conflagration. And my theory about this is that when uh, when Lyman Brown, maybe I don't know if it was Lyman Brown or maybe the person before him, the last mushroom grower, Nazareno, in World War II, he wanted to sell this cave. They said you know I need to get rid of all these wooden mushroom shelves that were in here. Just countless, you know, mushroom shelves. He torched that. That's my guess. He burned those. This must have been a fire, an underground fire that went on for a long time. And you know, the fire department of that day, they're very happy about it. But that's, I believe, the only thing that could explain this intense soot that is present throughout the cave. You know, if it were just in one room, it would be easily explained by a campfire. But this is. This is just so unusual. Hey, well. Expecting a, a giant cast iron sewer pipe, soil yeah. pipe, storm pipe, I don't know what it is. Some kind of pipe. There's some pipe, some drainage pipe on the old high bridge, I don't know. Oh, could be, could be. Uh, be interesting to, you know, if you could just like reconstruct the high bridge. Take yeah. <laughs> Like you said, the price of scrap iron must have been pretty low. Hey, you see a lot of it in here, the old hybrid. We should carry this out and see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, if you could get it somewhere, you'd make some money on that piece. Yeah, here we are in a rebar pit. <laughs> the, uh, this is debris from the 1985 demolition of the high bridge, the old high bridge. And we got all kinds of funky junk in here and it could be dangerous um, there's nails exposed you could uh, I just recently had a tetanus shot I hope you have too because who knows what you might step on some sharp piece or get cut or something uh, in this rebar snake pit as I call it hey old cast iron radiator some more parts Lots of junk. Endless 
uh, cave of junk. Some other point in time, I'll make a full video of the uh, walkthrough, which would be quite extensive. It's all far from the back right now. It's hard to say. I think oh, I don't know. Halfway between you and the end. Wow, that's impressive. Because you're what? You're probably 200 feet away from me. Oh, yeah, you can measure it on this map. I, I oh, all right, all right. How you exactly so it's it's impressive. This is just a side passage. Yeah. Wow. Big cave. Let me know when you're. Hey. No, I'm recording now. If you got something to say, say it. Yeah. So we are here in the fifth side passage, and this is the longest one in the cave. Um, and what it's really best for is you can see going back that you can see the effects of the bulldozer in the in the floor. Go the undulations in the floor. They go up and down. And it kind of marks the blade wavelength for this, uh, you know, when they were coming in here, they push a bit in with the debris, and then, you know, they pull, then they go, come, come get some more. And you can see here at about, like, something like about a five meter wavelength or something like that, distance between the crests of these um, dirt ridges, and it goes, like, all the way back. So this is the fifth passage? Yep, there's the other side. This is the, on the other side of the main drag. You see those, the perfectly, those bulldozer ridges and how they, you know, accomplish this, pushing all this fill material in here. And again, these, these, these side passages deep in the cave here, again, they're, they don't have a lot of metal in them. They're just, um, you know they're not there the, the metal rich passages are the ones right down right near down near water street oh yeah I don't know how many of those ridges there's just like dozens of them going back there up yeah. and down up and down well, if i had a better flashlight kind of running out of battery sadly there he is you to the end yet about halfway. Oh, you're only halfway? <laughs> Probably, yeah. It's about wow. halfway. Oh. Alright, I'm gonna kill the video. I think it's good enough. He's out of my frame anyway. So Alright. I'll get him when he's coming back. Sure. Here we are at the very end of the main axis of Becker Kids. So we're way up here now. So we're as far away from Water Street in a straight line as, as we can get here. And you can see, it just dead ends there. Um, I kind of expected an air shaft because a lot of mushroom growing requires proper ventilation and they're frequent air shaft. But at this point, if you were to have an air shaft, it would have to go up through about 300 feet of rock to get and it end up in Cherokee Park, which is right above us. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go down the, woo, the spooky sixth passage and that's off over this way and up to the what Dave Gerbloth in, in the 19, in 1981 wrote on his map is like the devil's altar or something like that so this 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 is like the end of our little unholy pilgrimage here we'll go see what 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 we find at the ultimate innermost sanctum of Becker Cave well, here we are at the innermost recess of the Becker Cave, which uh, is marked on this 1981 notation here. Uh, it says that this is the shrine. It's like, so here we are. And I, I agree in the sense that this is definitely the most ornate, carved up place uh, in the entire cave. You can see, if you look along the wall here, some... Uh, mostly skulls uh, of you know woeful aspect. We do have some some other things in here like Edvard Munch who did the screen, that painting the screen. You see that kind of head here. 
um, various bands. We have, you know, Led Zeppelin. We have Kiss. Um, so we have some homages there to uh, to rock music. Um, but you know what? This, re in an anthropological sense, what this reminds me of is um, when you're traveling through uh, the the Yucatan and in Mexico, and you see the uh, the Mayan glyphs, and they have these Mayan platforms just like with rows of skulls along the base, and that's kind of the sort of thing that this um, reminds me of here. Uh, there aren't very many religious emblems here. I mean, you do see some kind of allusions to religion, um, but, um, you know, there, there, there is, I, th I think there's a cross or two in here. Um, well, like, I think, like, here, okay, here's a cross right here. See that one. Um, some other religious motifs. But it, it tends to be, it seems to be more of a pagan type shrine, if you want to... <laughs> Put it that way for what for what it's worth. We're in the uh, the largest room in the cave in Becker Cave. Um, and this is the known as IMAX Theater. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually, I don't think it's deliberate. I think it is actually a collapsed dome. Um, and that's why on the fallout shelter map, they label it as sort of like an unsuitable space to keep people in. I think what you see here is that rocks that have tumbled made from the ceiling at one time or another. I mean, uh, and, and way up at the top, I mean, I still don't see the overlying Platteville limestone here, but um, it could be. Maybe it's under that smoke blackening. If you look down here, you can see the, uh, this is, you know, the, the Parisian catacombs were famous for the, their subterranean cinema. You know, they show movies underground and they have like chairs and stuff. And this is kind of the same thing I gather. Uh, I've never been at one of these events, and then you can see that, that it's kind of been scratched out, the, the, the sands, the soot's been scratched away, and they've provided a screen there. Um, and another person said that, was jokingly said that, um, that, that was, you don't really need to show movies there. If someone is, is somewhere high on something, they just stare at the wall, and they see all kinds of colors. Yeah, I don't know about that, but... So this is, so we're just, uh, I, my theory about this is that why the collapse is here is we're, we're entering an unstable region of the cave where, as you'll see in another place, there's actually a stream, a surface stream passing overhead, passing over the top of the cave. It's a natural stream, it's always been there. They dug under it, interestingly enough. In that area is kind of where we see the most collapse and the pools of water on the floor and that sort of thing. So um, that will be our, our next uh, adventure here. We'll, we'll head up that way. Just to point out, I guess they were they were hoping to, to hang some like chandeliers here or something. Uh, maybe that chandelier was to be um, ferried up to the ceiling by this helium balloon. Which <laughs> So what do you say that ceiling? How tall is that? 40, 50 feet? Oh, um, not that. I would say, you know... <laughs> well, careful. Never mind. Don't even look. I don't I want to... I would say it's about 30, yeah, it's about 30 feet up there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but this is... Oh, so it's a fish, yeah. So this is kind of the last of uh, the helium balloon, and... Um, that's practicable. Anyway. All right, cool. Well, thanks for the tour. Well, this is the lowest part of the cave, the sump, as a caver would call it, where the water settles. 
Um, but the water here is, it's definitely related to the fact that we have a surface stream flowing down over the cliff above. And you can see that on Water Street very clearly. There's a ravine that comes down and the spring water comes down from the Decorah Shale up near Cherokee Park, flows down to the ravine, and then eventually it's kind of like seeping in through cracks and crevices and, and ending up here. Um, and so that the, one of the things that is interesting that somebody else noticed here is that there's no smoke blackening on the walls here. And I think that's because that this part of the cave did not participate in the conflagration. There's a broken wall there right in the front of the camera, a broken edge. Like this part of the cave was walled off because it was an unstable area. Um, and you know, had water seepage and it just was not a good place for mushrooms. And so it was kind of walled off as a sump area. And I think that's, so probably that wall was intact at the time of the conflagration that produced the universal soot in the upper cave, you know, that, that we've already seen um, up there. And then right around the corner here, it looks like somebody's built a table or I guess, would that be a bar? It'd be a wet bar. <laughs> a wet, oh good. Yeah. A swim up bar basically. A swim it up, yeah. Oh, so, let's <laughs> Whoa. so, careful. The year was 1919, the start of Prohibition. So we had to build the bar in the cave to drink beer. Right here. This is the oldest bar in Becker Cave. This is an alternative history uh, channel right now. <laughs> totally alternative. Thank you.